Welcome to Salute Your Sports Week 21. Common Enchev, Tom Castleman, Drew Brackett. Uh, we have a big show today. We're going to start off with our NBA midseason report. A few other things to look forward to. Uh, college hoops, uh, NFL players on the move or staying home, uh, and uh, much more. Locks of the week. Uh, bad week for Drew Brackett, finally. That was something to see. Uh, we'll have more on that later in the show, as guys. If, as if either of us were any better. We were slightly <laughs> better this week, but it was a okay. after several good weeks for the show, it was a rough week if you chose to pick us uh, for our locks of the week. Can't win them all, guys, but uh, anywho. Uh, I can getting... even win half. Well, you can't win half. Drew and I are practically at half, almost. Uh, Tom Kasselman doesn't win half. But no. anyways, NBA midseason award show special. We're going to have college hoops uh, specials the next couple weeks. This week we'll start with the NBA. Um, midseason MVP, guys, I think this is one of the most intriguing, most wide open, closest races I have ever seen. Uh, there's about, literally about 10 guys who are all about equally deserving this year. Uh, what do you guys think is uh, – what does this race look like, and who is your midseason MVP? I mean, for me, it kind of comes down to some of the tiebreakers are more storyline-based in terms of who's the best player on one of the best teams in the league. And so, for me, I'm going to go with Joel Embiid as uh, my pick of MVP thus far, if things bear out. Uh, he's second in player efficiency rating behind uh, Nik- uh, Nikola Jokic. And uh, like I said, 76ers are in first place in the East after they've been perennially underachieving uh, Doc Rivers, and we might have some more things to say on him a little bit later with this midseason segment, uh, has been doing a great job getting the most out of a really talented player in Joel Embiid. A lot of people you know, knew that he was this talented. It was just a matter of could he be healthy enough? Could he put it all together? And, uh, I mean, he's really done that. I think second favorite for me is Nikola Jokic. I'm, I'm really big on the big men this year. Uh, that are playing really, really well and affecting the game in a lot of different ways. Something that is kind of nice and refreshing, given how guard-heavy the league has been, you know, the past generation or so. Yeah, I don't think we've had an MVP since Shaq, and I should have looked this up. I think it was 2000. I'm talking off the top of my head. If not, yes. 2000, I might be off by an year or two. Uh, Drew, are you also feeling the big men? I know you're originally from Denver. I don't know how closely you're following the Nuggets this year. Are you maybe going to go Jokic? Uh, go different than Tom, or are you still sticking with guards? What do, what do you think? I mean, if the Nuggets weren't a seven seed, yes, I'd go with Jokic. But the fact of the matter is the 76ers are the number one seed in the Eastern Conference. Uh, Embiid is averaging about 30 and 11, shooting 52% on the season. So he's putting up the stats, and he's on one of the best teams in the NBA. And you're right, he would be the first center since Shaq to win MVP since uh, 2000. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, uh, I'm going to lay out the stats and all the candidates. You know, you guys know i got to do this because I think there's a lot of guys not really being mentioned in this race that deserve to be. I think uh, if you look at uh, kind of the favorites, it's Jokic and Bede and LeBron. It'll probably go down to one of those three guys. Uh, just comparing Jokic and Embiid because it seems like that's where people on the show are leading, at least you guys, maybe not me. Uh, but uh, you mentioned that Drew Embiid is second in the NBA uh, in scoring about uh, 30 points a game um, and fourth in rebounds, 11.6 rebounds a game. The Sixers have the second best record in the league, the best in the East. Nikola Jokic, his team's the seventh seed. Uh, he's averaging 27 points a game, about three less. But this is kind of crazy to think about. Jokic, a center, guys, 8.6 assists. And Embiid only 3.3. Uh, Jokic first in player efficiency rating. And Embiid is second. Uh, just to throw out a couple guards out there. Bradley Beal leading the NBA in scoring with 33 a game. I know his team isn't doing very well, but he's not getting a lot of love. I do think Stephen Curry might be a little bit ahead of him, about 30 a game. But he's doing it more efficiently from three, more assists, more rebounds. Luka Doncic nearly averaging a triple-double this season. Uh, Damian Lillard, 29 points, 8 assists. Uh, James Harden leading the league in assists. And then 
Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, his teammates all putting up big numbers, shooting efficient percentages. So, I mean, all these guys to me are about on par. I see where you guys are going with Embiid or Jokic for the record. I would pick Embiid behind Jokic just because I think a center passing, uh, having nine assists a game is extremely mm-hmm. impressive. But it may come as no surprise to you guys. In an year where the MVP race is so close, I have to go with LeBron James. And LeBron James is, much like I say in soccer, Lionel Messi. He's the best player every year. Patrick Mahomes, he's the best player every year. And LeBron James is simply the biggest X factor in basketball. And for those who actually watch the games, LeBron James is far better than the stats indicate. The stats, by the way, are also pretty good. 26, 8, and 8, shooting uh, over 50%. Uh, career low, 34 and a half minutes this season for LeBron. But guess what, guys? He's played every game this year prior to last night, and he's played more games than the rest of the MVP candidates. No one in the league has played more games than LeBron James among the leading candidates, which is crazy to think about uh, at the age that he has. And here's a couple interesting stats. The Lakers right now, number two in the NBA on defense, and LeBron James, guys, how about this? How about this? LeBron James is, let me, let me pull up the stats right here. Uh, he is one of the best defenders in the league. Uh, he's scrolling through my notes. I believe he's, he was number one in uh, defensive efficiency rating, but I think he slipped to number two in the past two days behind Ru- Rudy Gobert. Uh, you look at the top five defensive guys, uh, an article I just saw had him listed as number four, but, uh, I mean, he's, he's stepped up his defense again this year. The last few years, we've talked about LeBron stepping back on defense. Here are the numbers, by the way. Leads the NBA in defensive win shares and fourth in defensive rating. And the uh, Lakers are number two in defense. So LeBron is doing it on both ends again, uh, just like he used to. I will say Embiid also playing very well uh, defensively for the Sixers. But I think LeBron James just makes things go. His team currently has, I think, the third best record now after losing to the Suns the other night and then losing without LeBron last night, uh, third or fourth best record in the league. But he impacts the game more than Embiid. He really does. He impacts the game even more than Jokic, which is crazy to think about. But he runs the show, and I think uh, they've got a new squad. If you watch the Lakers, he goes out of his way to get everyone involved. So he's not really concerned about his numbers. Uh, To me, LeBron James is the MVP. And it's a shame he only has four of them in his career. But if you're talking about, like, impacting the game overall, doesn't Nikola Jokic do more for the Nuggets than LeBron? Or he does as much, but in terms of, like, the numbers, I mean, he's on par with LeBron, and he plays a completely different position, almost an antiquated position. Well, first off, the numbers is he's averaging roughly – two points more or one point more, and he's averaging about half an assist more. So Yeah, it's I, a big man, though. If, if, if his numbers were significantly better than LeBron's, I would see that, but his numbers are, are very close. He also plays on a worse team, um, and they need him to do that. I know that's part of the whole most valuable uh, award thing, but LeBron, if you watch the Lakers, LeBron really wants to get these new guys involved. He wants Dennis Schroeder involved. He wants Montrezl Harrell involved. Uh, he, he wants his guys involved. I mean, we saw it last night. I know, obviously, Anthony Davis didn't play either, but the Lakers lost to the Kings, who have been one of the worst teams in the NBA in the last few weeks. I mean, when LeBron James sits, the team looks much different. Now, does the MVP even matter, though? I mean, your boy Russell Westbrook won. Lamar Jackson has won an MVP. One could argue that the MVP is just a, you know, to get the fans to watch. I mean, the, I think the NBA championship is the only thing that matters. Um, to an extent. I mean, obviously, we know Russell Westbrook did not deserve that MVP, getting that triple-double with the most inefficient numbers in basketball history, shooting about 42%, getting about five turnovers a game. Uh, set the record for most uncontested rebounds of all time in a season because basically Stephen Adams cleared the lane on free throws and let Westbrook get all the rebounds on free throws as if 
Like, had Steven Adams gotten the rebound, that helps his team more. I mean, it didn't make any sense. Uh, I, I mean, the MVP does matter. I think, I think obviously, the championship gets you more glory. But I think, I think an MVP matters. And I think LeBron James actually kind of wants the MVP. I think he was a little upset last year when he finished the distant second in the MVP uh, voting, and he kind of expressed that. I think that's part of the reason why he's playing all these games. Uh, but, I mean, probably since it's a storyline thing, I can see Embiid winning it. But Embiid might get hurt. We've seen, we haven't really seen him play a full season yet, so that's a big question mark with him. Uh, I know what I'm going to get from LeBron James the second half of the season. Uh, I'm not as convinced what I'm going to get from Embiid. I do think Jokic will keep it up. Jokic is a fantastic player. Uh, but uh, LeBron has a combination of the it factor, the numbers, the winning. Uh, he kind of he kind of has it all for me. And, I mean, it's a different game. Uh, Embiid, I mean, he's more – Embiid shoots jumpers and he hits outside shots, but he's more of like a traditional guy that needs guys to give him the basketball. I think the way the game has changed – uh, he doesn't impact the game as much, you know. He doesn't, he gets the three assists. I mean, like, you look at, like, Jokic, for example, sets up his teammates more, uh, just like LeBron James does. They, they're they more of a threat, not just to score the ball, but to do other things. So, I mean, I don't know. Who, where do you guys put LeBron in your in your race? Because you guys are big guys first. Who would be your third guy? I mean, LeBron... Probably is like kind of like in that three to four range. I mean, it kind of depends on, you know, what you kind of look at. Like, I, I don't think that player efficiency rating is the end all be all, but kind of looking at it as kind of a holistic, uh, you know, reading on how well a player is doing. I mean, LeBron James is 16th in the league in player efficiency rating behind his teammate, Anthony Davis. I think that uh, you look at guys, you know, Nicole Jokic and Joel Embiid are one and two in the league. So that's why for me, like, in addition to the fact that they put up the counting stats, they also have the efficiency behind that as well to show that they're not just getting it on, you know, volume or empty calories. Uh, but yeah, you look at players absolutely. like Luka Doncic, you know, he's at uh, seven in player efficiency rating, has been having a fantastic season. You look at a player like Damian Lillard, who doesn't uh, necessarily get as many rebounds because he plays the point guard position. But when you look what he does for Portland and how much worse off they would be if he weren't playing – and when you look at the numbers, especially when it's, you know, crunch time, you know, I know that he was like a, a dark horse, you know, more of like if you're taking a long betting shot for, for MVP. Uh, and, you know, I kind of picked him at the beginning of the year because I thought that he meant that much to that franchise. I, I think he still does. And you look at the games and how they win them. So many of them are close and so many of them are last minute shots. So I think LeBron's up there, you know, in like that three to five range, depending on how things shake out with the way that these guys play the rest of the season. I think Luka and, and, and Dame would, would round the top five for me. Yeah, he's definitely up there in the top five range. But I, I think everybody in the NBA knows he's probably the most impactful player on a team. It helps that he has Anthony Davis by his side and a really good team with the Lakers. But, you know, I, I think Giannis knows, like, you know, LeBron, eh, Giannis might be able to beat LeBron one-on-one -on -one just because Giannis is so much younger than him. Uh, yeah, but, I mean, at his age, I mean, he's doing incredible things. Yeah, I think LeBron James is more powerful than Giannis, personally stronger. So I think LeBron would still win that one-on-one -on -one battle. But that would be a heck of a game on uh, mm -hmm. one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I agree, by the way. Your top five is pretty good, Tom. I might only flip Curry slightly over Lillard, but you know you're you're messing with with numbers there that could go either way. I think Durant, if you were healthy, I think Harden, if you were you know if those guys weren't on the same team, that might be a, a different story. I think uh, those two mm -hmm. players are both better than Lillard personally. Um, but yeah, I mean it's 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 a good list. Uh, I, I will say this: the player efficiency rating, I do like that stat, but I think. A lot of those guys are bunched up. Uh, we're not looking at necessarily, you know, like when you say 16th, you know, he might be like a half point behind the 10th place guy or 11th place guy. And mm -hmm. that's why to me it's like if we were having a historic season, yeah, maybe I could see one of those guys. But whenever it's close like this, I like LeBron James. It is interesting to note 
Drew did bring up a good point. Uh, the last few MVPs, I mean, Giannis won. Uh, we have uh, Harden win recently. Westbrook, as I call him, not Westbrook, win recently. Um, was it Durant before that? I think the last Curry. MVP, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Curry is the last MVP to win the MVP and then win the championship. So in recent years, yes. the MVP hasn't been uh, doing much in the playoffs, uh, you know, compared to expectations. So we'll see. We'll see. So just finally, I've got LeBron and both of you guys have Embiid. Is that right? Yes. What about Defensive Player of the Year midseason? I mean, this is kind of partly on reputation, the fact that he's already won the award a couple of times. But for me, it's Rudy Gobert. Uh, he's the, the anchor and the best defensive player for uh, one of the best defensive uh, teams in the league for the Utah Jazz. Uh, he's second in the league and averaging 2.7 block shots per game. And even though it's not necessarily a straight-up defensive statistic, getting rebounds is a big part about closing out a defensive position uh, possession and then converting it into an offensive possession. He grabs 13 rebounds per game, which is also second in the NBA. So part on the statistics, part on reputation, uh, I'm going for Rudy Gobert as the defensive player of the year. Yeah, I agree. I mean, he's one of the best uh, rim protectors in the NBA, two-time defensive player of the year, 13 rebounds per game, almost three blocks per game. And, uh, you know, the NBA, while they like to differentiate the MVP award quite a bit normally, uh, I mean, Dwight Howard won like three defensive players of the year. Uh, ben Wallace won mm -hmm. four. So, I mean, I, I can definitely see it going to Rudy Gobert for the third time in four years. Yeah, Gobert, you guys mentioned that just a couple more stats. Second in rebounds and blocks, as you said. Also second in defensive rating. First in defensive win shares. Uh, passing up LeBron here in the last couple days. Uh, ninth in defensive plus minus. Uh, he he really is tough at the rim. Uh, a couple other guys, again, honorable mention. LeBron James, uh, he's up there. I mentioned that the Lakers are second in defense this season. And LeBron James, uh, second in player uh, efficiency rating, again, which is crazy to think about. Uh, one other guy to throw in that list is Ben Simmons. Uh, he's a guy mm -hmm. who guards one through five. He can guard any position. His coach, Doc Rivers, has said that he deserves the Defensive Player of the Year. Uh, he's first in, in um, deflections, creating deflections in the NBA, uh, first in loose, uh, loose balls, picking those up. So he's very crafty, and he guards a lot of different positions. Uh, ben Simmons might be a close second. Uh, the argument you'd have for him is that he simply uh, guards more positions than uh, Rudy Gobert. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, it's hard to argue against uh, Rudy Gobert. I mean, what he does defensively. I mean, as Shaq, Shaq makes fun of him for getting, you know, 12 points a game is what he says, makes millions of dollars. But that's because he does it, because he does that on the defensive end. He is one of those guys, he's not horrible on offense, but certainly kind of a rarity in the NBA where you pay a guy max money for being a defense first guy. That's his reputation, and he gets it done. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned uh, Ben Simmons. I think it'd be really, uh, I think it'd be kind of cool if we actually kept track of, of deflections a little bit more saliently than we do steals and blocks, because, you know, a lot of different statistics can be pretty misleading. You can have a player that's really good at blocking shots, but that's because he's always kind of chasing after that. That doesn't necessarily mean that he's a good defensive player. You know, causing deflections, that's disrupting a play before the ball even gets to the rim, which is hugely, hugely impactful. You know, that's the sort of thing where it's like it's a little bit of a stat nerd um, and, and enjoying different ways of measuring how players, you know, affect a game or impact a game. That would be an interesting thing to see a little bit more prevalently, but I don't think we're going to. <laughs> yeah, no, I did. As you guys know, I told you before the show, I did extensive research this afternoon, and I was defend researching Defensive Player of the Year, and there's an article saying why Ben Simmons should win the award, mm -hmm. and that was the things it listed. First in uh, deflections, first in loose balls, so he, he gets this up. It is a good point that you make, Tom, uh, I think certainly a little bit underrated defender, Stephen Curry, doesn't get enough credit. But Stephen Curry, maybe not this year, but throughout many years of his career, uh, he's been leading the league in steals or right up there. And 
he's not necessarily one of the best defenders in the league, but he he's crafty, so he gets steals. So it's it's kind of hard to measure because that's mm-hmm. not an award that it's only uh, stat based uh, for for a guy like Curry who gets a ton of steals, but he's not necessarily a lockdown one on one defender by any means. I've- I figured with your extensive research that you would have watched every single 76ers game and counted the Ben Simmons deflections. Well, uh, another time, my friend. We'll have we'll have plenty of time to watch that. I had, I had an article that that did my work for me, but I, I didn't have time to watch every single 76ers game this season. Uh, this I needed after- a tally on that. Yeah. I, I did I had I did see them against the Mavericks last week. Uh, they looked pretty good in that game. So uh, the thing about the 76ers is, can they do it in the playoffs? I think people forget this. Two years ago, um, they lost to the Raptors in Game Seven uh, in like a rolling shot that Kawhi Leonard rolled in, and then uh, the Raptors beat the Bucks, and then the Warriors had injuries in the finals. The only reason they lost those finals to the Raptors, I mean. The Sixers were a shot away from from beating the Raptors, and had they beaten the Raptors, there's a good chance that they could have won the championship. And then last year, of course, uh, Ben Simmons gets hurt, and Bede was dealing with injuries. Uh, Their record at this point of the year is about the same as it was last year. So a lot of people are saying, oh, well, here come the Sixers out of nowhere. Well, if you've paid enough attention the last couple years, uh, when Mm -hmm. healthy, uh, these guys have been doing this for for quite a while now so for me it's just going to be a matter of can their superstars stay healthy they both have injury concerns and how can they do in in the playoffs um yes but but thankfully uh your second favorite player of all time hit a miracle shot against the sixers to send the raptors to the championship second favorite player Kawhi leonard yes Uh, Your, your first is russell westbrook no so i mean first off I'm not as much I, – I don't mind Kawhi Leonard. All I've said is that he's just a little bit overhyped because he doesn't get a lot of assists, and he, he's really not a true leader. But uh, he's nowhere near Westbrook territory. The amount of dislike I have for Westbrook is way, way, way more than anything I can say about Kawhi Leonard. Um, but moving on. Most improved player, guys. Who do you think is the most improved player this year? So this kind of flies in the face of what I like in terms of efficiency from a player. Uh, I'm going with Jeremy Grant, who's taken a little bit of time uh, to bloom in the NBA. He's with the Detroit Pistons now and has been a solid role player for uh, the past couple of years, especially last year in Denver, but now has really exploded onto the scene um, in a way that's just you know, kind of taken Detroit by storm. Um, the thing that kind of, you know, I, I don't think he's necessarily a great player. I think he's greatly improved. But when you look at player efficiency, there are 60 players in the league more efficient than he is. So I think a lot of the numbers he's putting up, I think he's around like 23 points per game, give or take. Uh, it's probably a lot on volume because the Detroit Pistons are one of the worst teams in the league. So he's playing a lot of minutes. He's putting up a lot of shots, getting a lot of points. Uh, I think that's what's going to win it for him. When you look at some of the other candidates, you have um, Jalen Brown for Boston. Uh, He's having certainly the best year of his career, but he's had plenty of pretty good years before. Same thing with Julius Randle, taking it to another level, but kind of going from a a quality level to a higher quality, whereas Jeremy Grant's going from role player to quality player. Um, If he'd played more games, I think Houston's Christian would. Uh, would have been a shoe in, but he just has it. He's been too injured this year. Um, otherwise, I think he would have it hands down. But for me, it's it's Jeremy Grant. Yeah, I think, I th- I think you go. Who did you pick, Common? I picked Christian Wood. Uh, I I got to look at the games played again. How many games has he played, Tom? Uh, I think he's missed. Let's see where he is. He's played 17 games this season. Hmm. Out of because I don't know if Houston's had like any. Um, like if they had a stretch of like COVID games that he's missed, um, they Houston's played, played thirty three games. Yeah, the thirty four games. They're eleven and twenty three, so he's played half of their games. Well, I will say part of it too coincides with him. Uh, they've been on a big losing streak recently, and that's when he's been <laughs> out. 
Uh, I did put down Christian Wood, but surprisingly, I'll be honest with you guys, I, for some reason I completely missed the amount of games he played, so I can see your argument there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Julius Randle would be a great pick just because uh, his team is playing much better and mm -hmm. his numbers uh, are, are up across the board, and he's kind of really maturing into a good NBA player. I will say, though, I did put Christian Wood because uh, he's up from 13.1 points per game to 23.6 points mm -hmm. per game, uh, 10.7 rebounds compared to 6.3, uh, 1.6 blocks to 0 0.9. He's essentially nearly doubled his numbers, and Shaquille O'Neal didn't know who he was prior to this year. And now Shaq knows who he is. That in itself tells you enough because he's an NBA analyst, and maybe Shaq and Charles don't always pay attention to you know who all the all the players are in the league the way I do. But um, clearly, Christian Wood has made massive improvements. I would say he hands down uh, runs away with it. But because of the sheer uh, mm -hmm. game thing you mentioned, Tom, I could go with, with um, who you went with, Grant. But I do think you brought up a good point. Uh, Grant's numbers are up because he plays on a bad team. Sure. So I'll, I'll go with Wood if we don't look at the games played, especially if he plays Thanks. most of the games in the second half, I think he is going to win it. But otherwise, I'll go with Julius Randle. The New York Knicks, all of a sudden in playoff position, uh, number one in defense with uh, Tom Thibodeau, our former Chicago Bulls coach. Uh, sad to see him go, but also good to see him succeeding on another team. And he, br he brought back Derrick Rose. Derrick Rose has been on, like, all his teams. Same thing with Taj Gibson. He likes getting the band back together. Uh, Drew, who's your uh, <laughs> six-man pick of the year or mid-season? Uh, most improved is Julius Randle, but my sixth uh, man of the year, I'm going to go with Mizzou legend Jordan Clarkson, of course, on the Jazz. You know, 18.2 points per game, his career high, and he's one of the main reasons that the Jazz have been so good offensively. So you got to go with Clarkson. Yeah, My bad. I, I skipped positions on you, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys talked about it, so I, I would go with Randall on the most improved. Yeah. Uh, sixth man of the year, we're on the same page. Uh, Jordan Clarkson, 18 points a game, second on the team in scoring, which is crazy to think about, that a guy coming off the bench on the number one team in the NBA according to record. Now, I don't think they're the number one team in the NBA, but record-wise, they have the best record in the league, and you have – a guy coming off the bench, uh, second on the team in scoring. Uh, he really gets in there, and he provides a big spark off the bench. Again, I've caught some Jazz games, and I kind of pay attention to Clarkson. He's one of those just pure energy guys that maybe he's even a little better uh, than the stats show. I mean, he comes off the bench, and it's, it's instant energy. So I, I, I think Clarkson uh, is the pick for me. Uh, and I don't know that anyone is really – that close? I mean, who, who would be closer? I was really struggling. I mean, Eric Gordon comes off the bench sometimes. He has good numbers as usual. He's always up there. Uh, but I think he's gotten some starts this year, and the Rockets are struggling. Uh, Lou Williams, I think, but he hasn't done as good this year. I mean, what, who are the other candidates, guys? I don't even know. I, I think it's Clarkson in a runaway. Yeah, I think Clarkson's a pretty clear runaway here, too, because you know, he's not like the most complete player in terms of talking about, like, oh, who's the best bench player in the league? But sixth man has kind of traditionally been like, who's the guard that comes off the bench that gives you a lot of points? Uh, so, you know, it's Clarkson's for me, too. Um, yeah, I think it, Jamal uh, Crawford's retired, so I don't right, think we'll yeah. go with <laughs> Exactly, yeah. yeah. Someone else. Or Lou Williams. So, yeah, no, it's 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 Jordan Clarkson uh, for me as well. And I, I think, you know, I'd have to do a little bit deeper digging. But from what I was seeing, like, it's not even close. It's, it's, it's Jordan Clarkson in the field, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Rookie of the year, kind of the same story. Uh, LaMelo Ball is kind of making me eat my words. Uh, he's been he playing. is, actually. Very yeah. much so. He, he has been playing – fantastic. Actually, the last month he's been even better, and, and they put him in the starting lineup now, and he's playing even better, averaging 16, 6, and 6. Of course, we'd like the field goal percentage to be a little bit better, but still not bad, a well-rounded guard, and they're really a terrible rookie class. You know, uh, he's been pretty good. Everyone else has been pretty bad. I mean, 
we had that one dunk by Anthony Edwards, but his efficiency is like way low. So it's got to be Lamelo. Yeah, I yeah. agree with that one. I mean, it's. I, I think what we're seeing is um, like a little bit of poise. Uh, it, it, this isn't the case for every player that instead of going to college here in the U.S., they go play professionally elsewhere. He was in Australia, I believe. I forget which team specifically. Um, but uh, while it's a, a slightly different pace and, and, you know, the game's still the same, it's a little bit different style, he's looking a little bit more polished than a, a bunch of these other rookies having had that professional experience. And, of course, you know, his older brother Lonzo's been in the league a couple of years. So, you know, he's kind of always been primed for this. I'm sorry? I don't think he's already better than Lonzo halfway into his rookie year. He's better than Lonzo's ever been in the NBA. I don't know. Lonzo's been having a pretty good year under uh, Stan Van Gundy and the Pelicans. So I don't know if I necessarily would say, I mean, LaMelo Ball probably has the higher ceiling. I don't know if I'd put him over Lonzo right now, um, it but it's definitely not. closer than we expected. That's for sure. Oh, I mean, I expected him to probably be better. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm not very high on either Ball brothers, although LaMelo is kind of making me eat my words to an extent. Um, I think I think he's more... He's more of a playmaker. He's a little more flashy than than Lonzo, um, and I think he's a little bit like quicker. So I mean, I don't know. Hard to say, but sixth man, pretty easy. Coach of the year. What do we think about coach of the year, guys? Well, for me, I'm going to stick with a little bit of the former Mizzou theme. I'm going to go with Quinn Snyder. Uh, best record in the league. He's getting the most out of a group of talented, even though they're not necessarily the elite of the elite NBA players. He's getting the most out of a cohesive group where guys just seem to fit together really, really well. Uh, Utah is third in the NBA in offensive efficiency. They are tied for second in the NBA in defensive efficiency. So doing it on both ends of the court. And then when you look at some of the uh, little more nerdy Uh, offensive figures you've got fourth and effective field goal percentage and third and true uh, field goal percentage or true shooting percentage and they're second in rebounding so they're good at pretty much every single phase of the game and uh, I think that's a testament to the coaching job that he has done with again really good players Donovan Mitchell Rudy Gobert Um, but as we've kind of talked about all season they're not the ones that are atop the list as far as the most talented team no not at all I, I completely agree with you here real quick uh, honorable mention to Monty Williams of the Suns. Uh, he's got them in second best mm-hmm. record of the West, I think, now. Uh, they're they're actually probably overachieving a little bit as well, although Drew and I do love the Suns uh, come playoff time. Um, 76ers, Doc Rivers doing a great job over there, uh, really getting Embiid and Simmons to gel. Well, really getting the best of Embiid. Uh, part of it is health, but Embiid uh, has always been very good, but he's never been this good. So Doc Rivers, I think, probably helped that a little bit. But for me, Quinn Snyder is uh, the the obvious answer. Uh, You talked about Hmm. all those uh, numbers that the Jazz have. Uh, I think you said they're third in offensive efficiency rating? Correct. And what are they in points? They're right up there, around there, too. Uh, Oh, I don't actually even look at it points necessarily because that's kind of that's also a function of pace of play so i go by you know you know normalize everything to 100 possessions talent wise the jazz don't have the third best uh, offensive talent in the league Mm -hmm. i think uh what he's doing with that that team is incredible i mean we have rudy gobert who's practically a defensive player i think uh jordan clarkson our mizzou guy we talked about him earlier having a career year like he's a good player but a few years back he couldn't even get on the court with the Cavaliers when mm-hmm. LeBron was leading him into the playoffs. Um, Mike Conley is a good player. You know, he's pretty good. But, I mean, you look at these guys, like Donovan Mitchell was your best player. Donovan Mitchell's a good player, no doubt about it. But he's not a top ten player in the league. He's, I mean, there's no one can argue and say Donovan Mitchell is a top ten player in the NBA. He simply is not. He's a small guard you know, but he's gotten Mitchell, Gobert, Conley, uh, you know, Ingles, uh, Bogdanovich, who they missed in the playoffs last season. He's gotten those guys to move the ball well. If you've ever watched the Utah Jazz basketball game or even gone on Twitter and searched Jazz ball movement, which, yes, I have done that, Drew, because it is a thing of beauty, uh, they, they move the ball a lot like the Spurs did uh, a few years back, a lot like the Warriors. It's a free-flowing offense. 
and Quinn Snyder is getting the most of what is, quite frankly, just above average offensive talent, and he's making them into, into something special. And even defensively, they've all, they're good, too. I mean, other than Gobert, it's, they don't have phenomenal athletes. They have a lot of small guards in Mitchell, Clarkson, uh, Conley, but they, they get it done. I think Quinn Snyder has to get a, a ton of credit, the former Mizzou coach who led the Tigers as a 12 seed to the Elite Eight with Kareem Rush, former Laker that won the championship, the lefty shooter, uh, Quinn Snyder getting the job done at all levels. Getting Let's you talk. off your soapbox here, I'm going to go with not Quinn Snyder because that is not the correct answer. We oh. thought the Jazz the Jazz had high expectations for this season. Obviously, we didn't think they'd be the one seed in the Western Conference at this point in time, but they were going to be a playoff team, a team that was not going to be a playoff team. The New York Knicks, give credit to your guy Tom Thibodeau in his first year coaching the Knicks. I mean, this is a guy who took over a young team, R.J. Barrett, uh, Mitchell Robinson. Of course, they have the veteran in Julius Randle, but they're the best defensive team in the league, averaging uh, just allowing 104 points per game. They're the fourth seed or fifth seed in the Eastern Conference right now, so you got to believe that it's uh, your boy. That's not a bad pick. Actually, now, now you're kind of selling me and putting him in second place in this just because I do think – the Suns also had some expectations. The Sixers certainly. I do like Thibodeau. I think he's he's a great coach. Um, it'll be so interesting to see what happens in the East because if you look at the records outside of the top three, about four through ten, they're all like roughly mm-hmm. even, only like several games separating them. So um, I think um, it'll be re- interesting to see. I mean, I think the Knicks will make the playoffs, but do they stay at that four seed? I'm not so sure that they do. I, I think, though, uh, having that strong defense right away definitely does help in a COVID season. I wouldn't put him in the top four or five, but I think maybe just outside the top five, if you're talking about uh, coaches that have improved their team and you're talking about the Bulls. Well, how about Billy Donovan? Billy Donovan has done an excellent job in Chicago. He has essentially the same roster plus Patrick Williams this season, and they're their defense has some work still, but their offense has gone way up. I mean, even Zach mm-hmm. Levine has gone way up. We didn't we talk about most improved player. We probably could have mentioned him. Certainly was a very good player last year, but he's taken his game to another level too. So I think Billy Donovan, if we're going to go with, you know, maybe teams who are around 500 or just under for the Bulls who have been improved by their coach, uh, Billy Donovan has to be in the mix there. He's done a very good job. Ironically, he's kind of doing the opposite of Thibodeau. Thibodeau's gone in there and improved the Knicks' defense. Donovan has gone in there and improved the Bulls' offense. So they're kind of doing it in different ways. Before we move on, Thibodeau or Thibodeau? I think it's Thibodeau, is it? Or what is it, Tom? I've heard it both ways. We, this Me might too. be a, a, a Gonzaga, Gonzaga kind of thing. We decided uh, it's Gonzaga, didn't we? How to pronounce. I've heard Thibodeau. I've heard Thibodeau. I, I, I think, didn't know. I think it's Thibodeau. Th, like Spanish. Th. I thought the to H Google, was silent. Uh, according to, to Google, the Google machine says that it is Thibodeau. Yeah, like what I said. Yeah. That's what I'm talking okay. about. I know yeah, that's my, what I said, that, too. I've heard it both ways. I figured Tom would know. Well, it's, it's when I Drew... I had looked that one up. <laughs> when, when, well, I got it right, by the way. But when Drew when Drew used to call McCole Hardman, Miko Hardman, because Jim Nance said it, well, Jim Nance said it wrong. It's Miko Hardman. Well, you need to uh, knock on Nance's door and let him know. You got to let him know. Well, and him... all the other announcers, Kevin Harlan. Oh, I love Kevin Harlan. The most underrated announcer. I mean, the best announcer mm-hmm. is hands down Ray Hudson in soccer. No one comes even close with the passion and energy and clever sayings he comes up. But the second most underrated announcer definitely has to be Kevin Harlan. He followed me on Twitter a few years back and then unfollowed me. So he must not have been Oh, no. Man, you weren't producing the content he wanted. Come no, on. Ironically, 
He followed me after I tweeted something about his call on the Mizzou-UCLA game back in 2014. That's when Jordan Clarkson was on Mizzou and Zach Levine was on UCLA, actually, back then as a star freshman. So that's when that's when that happened, 2014. So he followed me for about a week, and then I think – Oh, wow, um, it was only a week. After seeing some Arkansas prep sports, you probably had enough. <laughs> Yeah, I think the the Friday night football probably wore him out. Yeah, it would have been uh, basketball season at the time. but yeah. Oh, basketball. Yeah, probably. Um, anywho, I think, I don't know, Drew, that was good, man. That was a good one. I, I like that. I, I don't often like what you say, but I thought that was very good insight, my friend. I can bring it at times. <laughs> yeah, well, you brought it. Uh, oh, yeah. Speaking of bringing it, uh, NBA stars have brought it this year. We got a star-studded cast in the NBA All-Star Game. Just real quick, guys, a uh, one-day event. Uh, they've got the Skills Challenge, followed by the three-point shootout, the All-Star Game, the dunk contest at halftime. That's interesting. And then the, um, the second half of the All-Star Game itself. Again, we're picking teams, uh, LeBron James and uh, Kevin Durant being the captains. Uh, real quick, uh, what do you guys think about uh, kind of the format of the game itself this year, the game happening? I know there's been a lot of conflict. Should we have it? Should we not? Because uh, personally, I love it. I think it's a great compromise. We still get the Oscar game. We get it in a day. They get a little bit extra rest, the players do. Mm -hmm. And we get to see a fun Oscar weekend on one day, on a Sunday, March 7th. Yeah, as a sports fan, I'm not a huge fan of consuming exhibition games. I don't watch the Pro Bowl. I don't really watch NHL or NBA uh, All-Star Weekend or anything like that. But reading up on the formats, you know, I like everything about it. Um, I, I really like the, the idea that came out a couple of years back and that they're, of course, doing again this year of, of doing kind of like the schoolyard picking teams. Um, I like that they are breaking down each quarter starting 0-0. Zero, zero. And then whoever wins the quarter uh, wins money for charity, basically. I like that they are able to use the platform and, and put some competitive element into it where, you know, it's not just, oh, this game doesn't really matter, so nobody played defense until the fourth quarter or the last half of the fourth quarter. It's, you know, there are very real, there's a very real impact on the line for, you know, uh, for, for where money gets to go for that sort of thing. So, you know, I'm a fan of, of how they're doing it. They're trying to keep everything as compact as possible. Uh, you know, kind of like you said, they struck the right note on trying to get a compromise between the protocols and how, you know, and making sure everybody stays safe and not having as a multi-day event like they usually do. Um, you know, I, I think that they're, they're working it pretty fine and it'll be a pretty fun event for those who enjoy watching it. I might probably not be one of them, but... Uh, it certainly seems interesting for everybody else. Yeah, I've been a sucker for the NBA All-Star weekend and festivities since I can remember. So, uh, you know, I'm good with the one day, totally understand why it's happening. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I always like to see the best players on the court at the same time. I think the Elam ending is definitely going to help. We saw last or whatever year it was, uh, we definitely saw it help. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be watching, and it's going to be awesome. Do you guys think there was any all-star snubs this year? Just real fast, anyone stick out to you or, or not really? Uh, as presently constituted or from when it came out? Because I feel like with the injuries, kind of the, the whole snub thing kind of worked itself out. I know a lot of people were upset, you know, Devin Booker uh, wasn't named a, an MVP, but you know, or uh, an all-star rather, but um, with, uh, you know, just various injuries, he's now in the game. So I think at this point, we've kind of gotten to a point where it's kind of hard to say that there are any real snubs uh, given the players that are involved. And really, I think we could just kind of eliminate the conversation going forward if we just expand rosters from 12 all-stars to 15, uh, similar to how they do with just regular NBA rosters. Granted, only 12 dress for a regulation game, but Expand it to 15, and uh, you're going to have a lot, you know, a, a lot fewer people griping about who's really a snub because I think that's kind of the cutoff line between the best of the best and the really, really good. Drew, 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, Devin Booker, you know, obviously, I don't know why he didn't make it, but now that he's in, uh, things have worked themselves out with the injuries. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. 25 points a game on a team that we've talked about second in the West. Mm -hmm. Definitely deserving. Probably should have gotten in right away, but he's in now. DeMontis Sabonis, maybe another one. Uh, He got in after uh, Durant's injury, 21 points, 11 rebounds, 6 assists. Quietly having a great season with the Pacers. I think they got it right. A couple guys, though, that probably are all-stars many seasons and would be all-stars under Castleman's system. Uh, Colin Sexton having a very good season for the Cavaliers, uh, 24 points a game, 49% from the field, 40% from three, 80% from the line, four and a half assists. Chris Middleton and Jamal Murray both over 20 points per game on the season. Uh, Good number two options on good basketball teams. Uh, Those guys certainly just barely missed out, but overall, I can't gripe too much about it. I think they got the All-Stars uh, pretty right. Real quick, mm-hmm. All-Star weekend, we're going to make a couple picks. Uh, I don't know if Drew even knows who's competing in some of these events, but the NBA Skills Challenge. Guys, who's going to win that? Uh, for skills, I will go with Luka Doncic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Ooh, quite the list of names here. Uh, let's see. I would say Chris Paul the likely winner of the NBA Skills Challenge. I completely agree. I knew you would go with Chris Paul. I knew Tom would go with Luca. I just had a feeling that would happen. Um, Luca is the better overall player, but in the Skills Challenge situation, I think Chris Paul is maybe a slightly better passer, and I think certainly a better uh, shooter, at least in an open game situation. So I like Chris Paul to win that. Drew and I on the same page. How about that? Uh, NBA three-point contest, Stephen Curry, Zach Levine, Devin Booker, Donovan Mitchell, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown. Uh, It's going to be a heck of a three-point contest. I do like Steph Curry. We saw him make 105 threes in a row in practice recently. Uh, He's won this award before. I think Booker has won it also, the three-point contest. I think uh, Stephen Curry runs away with it uh, and has a historic three-point contest this year. No reason to go against your favorite. Yeah. Historic. Oh, wow. Well, I'll I'll either go – I'm thinking uh, Booker may win it again. Uh, Otherwise, you know, good value in Booker and then uh, Zach Levine as well. Obviously, Curry's the best shooter out of those guys, but, you know, it's a three-point contest. A lot of it is about, you know, if you're hot that night. uh, I mean, Curry's release is really fast, too. I don't think um, Jalen Brown or Tatum, I don't think those guys are win just because their re- releases aren't the fastest. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think you go with Booker, Levine, or Curry. Okay. No well, disrespect to Donovan Mitchell, but I, I just I don't think he'll win either. Everyone disrespecting Donovan Mitchell this year. It's okay. Shaq disrespects him. We all disrespect him, but that's fine. His team is first in the NBA, so that's fine. He's, he's doing just fine. Um, so which one are you going to pick? Pick one. I want to know because I'm going to tally this to see who got it right. <laughs> of oh, of course he's going to tally. Um, man, I really want to go with Booker. Uh, I'll go uh, Levine. I'll okay. go Levine. Zach Levine. Booker, my number two, by the way, because he gets uh, really uh, really streaky. And he can, he can easily knock seven, eight in a row. A uh, dunk contest, uh, Drew Brackett doesn't even know some of the names in this. Uh, Anthony Simmons uh, of the Blazers. Cassius Stanley, I think, is on the Pacers. And Obi Toppin on the Knicks. Guys, who do we think is going to win this dunk contest? I hate how this dunk contest has become a bunch of no-names, essentially a bunch of role players. We have seen some of them, though, do really well in it and then kind of propel their careers, I think, uh, not that he's a great player, not that he was bad before, but I think Aaron Gordon performed well in the dunk contest, and that seemed to take a step. And Zach Levine, I mean, Zach Levine used mm-hmm. to be more of a dunker, and now he won it a couple years in a row, and now he's all of a sudden a three-point shooter too. So I don't know. We'll see. Maybe these guys could be good. Young players, young players. 
I mean, I think the creativity aspect of the dunk contest, is, is, there's only so many things that you can do and we can start, you know, almost literally jumping sharks. That's when we'll know we've gone too far. So somebody brings in an actual shark to jump over it. Um, I'm going to go for kind of like an adopted favorite team of mine. Anthony Simmons for the, uh, the Portland Trail Blazers is my pick to win the slam dunk contest. Interesting. Uh, so Simmons is 6'3". Oh, uh, yeah. We know Top, Toppin dominated uh, at Dayton. You know, he was one of the uh, most exciting players to watch at Dayton. Um, Stanley, uh, he has a 44-inch vertical. I'll take that. Cash is Stanley. Yeah, I think it's going to be between Simmons and Stanley because – they're the shorter guards. Uh, I think Simmons is an inch shorter than him, though, so that's why I'm going to go with Simmons. Uh, the big guys never do well in these contests, with the exception of Blake Griffin. Back when he could jump, I really feel for Blake Griffin. He hasn't even been able to dunk the basketball anymore. It's such an odd sight to see a basketball game and Blake Griffin not throwing down dunks. So, But mm-hmm. other than Blake Griffin, I don't, can't even remember if a big guy has ever won this competition before. I mean, Aaron Gordon's a power forward. Um, he's more of a small power forward. Didn't Dwight Howard win one? I don't think so. Yeah, Superman won one. Did he win one? Oh, no, maybe. Where was that Nate Robinson? He lost to Nate Robinson, I think. I think he did. I don't know. Anyways, the point is that the big guys don't tend to do well, so Obi Toppin definitely is my, my pick not to win. Howard did win in 2008, so a while back, but he did win that year. Okay. Well, it happened. But I agree. Smaller guy. I'll go with Simmons to disagree with Drew because I love disagreeing with Tom, but it's even more fun to disagree with Drew. I do get a a kick out of Tom Castleman's adopted teams just because of what we talk on the show. Like, he adopted the Indianapolis Colts. That didn't work Mm -hmm. out so well for him. Now he's adopted the Blazers. We'll see how... How that yep. works out. <laughs> we'll see. I do like the Blazers tonight. That's a tease to locks of the week. So I am a Has it already started? No, it starts at nine o'clock. So we're we're safe. Part of the late card. Yeah, the late card. So <laughs> I'm adopting the Blazers for tonight at least. Speaking of adopting though, guys, right around this time of year. <laughs> Uh, we're not talking kids, Drew. Right around this time what of year. What are we adopting here? People. People adopt. I, I want to hear this transition. <laughs> people adopt college basketball teams to like. With March Madness just around. Ah, the summer, okay. You pick yourself a little Cinderella team, and you just become hooked by the mascot, the star player. The school actually makes me think to my so my fifth grade teacher – uh, Mr. Shields, who, by the way, uh, would be ecstatic to know that I've done a lot of sports broadcasting stuff in my career. Um, he always you didn't have lunch with him the other day? I have not had lunch with him in a few years. I lost his phone number, so I'm really upset about it. <laughs> That's no but, surprise. But, but, but anywho, we had lunch at one point when I was in college. But um, we had a thing we used to do in fifth grade where uh, we, he let us watch the NCAA tournament in class. And we would each get, like, two or three teams. Everyone in the class would have, like, three teams that they get picked. And whoever's team won the tournament would get this brand-new awesome basketball he had. But part of getting our team, we had to learn the state color, the state bird, the state flag, what is the state known for, the state nickname. So wherever state our team was from, we had to learn all about that state. Just a very creative way uh, by a fantastic mm-hmm. teacher, uh, Bob Shields, I had. He was born in Topeka. Mm-hmm. So, what is the speaking of Kansas? What is the state color of Kansas? I, I don't like that state. Being having been a Missouri. All right. Grad, what is the state color of Illinois? Of Illinois, probably blue, but I'm not sure. You can probably look. That I don't up. think there's such thing as a state color. <laughs> Maybe it's just the state the state flag or whatever. There I, you go. State flag, state bird. How about that? State bird, okay. Uh, there you go. For Missouri, it's the Cardinal, but maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. 
Ooh, that's a tough know. one. That's a stretch. That's a stretch. That's a stretch. The St. Louis Cardinals? Uh, well, guys, anyway, we are going to have a very special uh, college basketball segment next week where we predict the conference tournament uh, champions out of the Power Five. I mean, that is not the Cardinal, by the way. What is it? It is the Eastern Bluebird. Wow. Well, I did not have a team from from Missouri when I did when I did that tournament. One of my teams, by the way, fun fact, was Creighton back when they had Kyle Korver and they upset Florida. It was a 5-12 upset. Uh, this was back in uh, gosh, uh, oh. What would have that been 1999? 90s. It's Corver. I mean, that guy, he's like probably 02, 40. 02, maybe? Was I hmm. in fifth grade? I think 02. I don't um, know. So, anyway, yeah, Kyle Corver and Creighton upset Florida. I think Florida had Mike Miller at the time. There's another blast from the past for you. So, that was that was a fun little tradition, and that's actually what really got me into the college basketball tournament uh, after we did that, I was immediately hooked. I did follow it before, but that's when I kind of became obsessed. So big credit to uh, my teacher at the time, uh, Mr. Shields. Uh, but we are going to get into it, guys. So we're going to talk Power 5 next week, and, and in two weeks we'll do March Madness special. Uh, Gonzaga certainly is going to go all the way in my bracket, that's for sure. Uh, but speaking of Gonzaga, they're from a smaller conference. A lot of the smaller conference tournaments tipping off this week, um, the mid-majors. Uh, what what are you guys looking for? What teams are some of the top teams that maybe you want to look for? Uh, some of the storylines, some of the conferences. What are you guys looking at this weekend? Are you going to watch a little college hoops maybe? Certainly no NBA Friday or Saturday. A lot of soccer for me to watch, but I'll try to tune into some college hoops as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't have to look uh, very hard or very far for uh, you know my smaller uh, small school team that I really enjoy. I'm going to go with Loyola. It's an alma mater to uh, my wife and a lot of my friends uh, from high school. Um, so they're my favorite small school. I mean, I, I, I listen to Porter Moser. He occasionally occasionally goes on sports talk radio here in Chicago, does interviews. Great sounding guy, and has kind of resisted some overtures of leaving. Uh, the Loyola program, especially when they went on their big Final Four run uh, back in, I think it was 2018. And, of course, you know, a player from that run, you have Cameron Crutwig, the big man who does literally everything. He leads the team in points, rebounds, and assists. Uh, this is a team that uh, usually uh, they're not going to put up a whole lot of points, but they're going to defend well. They're going to rebound. They're going to do all the little things to eke out victory. So, um, for me, that's an easy, easy choice for uh, for me to cheer for heading into the big dance. I love it. Yeah, you don't you don't have to go far uh, to look for yours. But I tell you, the, the one of the cool things about working from home is you get to have, sometimes you can have a TV on in the background. And, well, today I, I had to watch the A-10 tournament on NBC Sports Network. So a lot of talent in the A-10. And this year, you know, there's, not really one team that's ranked or anything, but there's just a lot of talent there. So I watched the du- Duquesne-Richmond game, uh, UMass and St. Joseph's, and then one that just wrapped up before our show, Dayton and Rhode Island. So uh, A-10, fun to watch, and then you got to give uh, something that's close to here, uh, that small conference, a Southern Conference. Uh, you got the UNCG Spartans, Wofford, Furman, all those schools that are around here in North Carolina, that's always a fun tournament to watch as well. As well. Yeah, Wofford is a team that tends to make a tournament or do well in the tournament. Uh, I'm keeping a very, very close eye on the Missouri Valley, so I'm kind of going back to Tom. Uh, he talked about uh, Loyola Chicago, the number 20 in the country, 21-4. and four. Uh, We saw Sister Jean and the team in 2018 make the Final Four so that's the team to look out for. Drake, also 24-3. and three. Uh, The team that I will be cheering for out of the Valley, though, is Missouri State. Uh, they're 16-6, and six, and their leading scorer, Isaiah Mosley, 20 points per game. I covered his games at Rockbridge High School in Columbia, Missouri. I still have no idea why Mizzou didn't want him. I know they had a lot of guards on their roster, but gosh, I tell you, he's better than most of them. 20 points per game this year. 
uh, leading the team in scoring, I believe, the conference also. And guess who else is on his team? Jamonte Black, his high school teammate, third on the team in scoring at about 10 points per game. So I covered those two guys when I worked in Columbia, a Missouri hmm. area for the TV station there. Uh, and they were two of the key pieces to the Rockford State Championship team, uh, two fantastic players, uh, both of them coming up big in the state championship. They beat Caleb Love in UNC in that game. Caleb Love now at UNC was playing in that game for, I think, CBC was the high school. Uh, he's underachieved a little bit at UNC. Fun story, Dewan Harris, also a member of that team, he was also going to Missouri State, but ended up going to Kansas, of all places. So he's a backup point guard on the KU roster. But at the time, I remember following it closely and reporting on it, that we had the three star players, the three all-state selections, all going to Missouri State together. Um, so Harris ended up going to KU. But uh, Mosley and Black are succeeding at Missouri State. I think the Missouri Valley is oftentimes uh, – Arguably the best uh, mid-major conference on average. Certainly it does vary year to year, but we've seen other years back in the days when Southern Illinois was actually really good. Of course, you mentioned the Loyola run uh, a couple years ago, and I think we had some teams from the Valley upgrade to other conferences because it was such a strong conference. So mm -hmm. uh, I will probably a good conference to tune in because I think uh, we've got – Loyola, I mean, they're in the tournament regardless, but Drake and Missouri State, those teams may not make the tournament, but if they upset Loyola, uh, those are teams that could also uh, create create some havoc. I will give you one team, and I don't know if you guys kind of have Loyola as your team, but is there a team just not ranked? I mean, I know a lot of people don't know about Loyola, but a lot of people do. They're ranked number 20. The team that I'm looking for and hoping for a uh, mid-major run is Belmont out of the Ohio Valley. Mm -hmm. I think we see Belmont almost every year make uh, – not almost every year, but many years make the tournament, and they've yet to really make a run. They always lose in the first round. A lot of times they play close games, but it just doesn't quite work out for them. Well, what is this? This is a COVID year. There's been so many cancellations, so many teams playing less games. Guess who has played pretty close to a normal schedule? Belmont, 25 and three guys. I don't know what's more impressive that they're 25 and three, or the fact that they've actually played 28 basketball games. I don't know how many schools can say that. So I think that they have that camaraderie down. They've had the ability to have rhythm in the season. Uh, they'll probably be something in the range of a 13 seed. Uh, so maybe they can upset, uh, you know, 12-5. 13-4, 14-3 type upset. I would love to see Belmont uh, make make a run, you know, maybe not a deep run, but at least an upset in the first round. Uh, that would be a team to look out for. Belmont is a school that I perennially pick to go much further in the tournament than they actually do. Uh, this year, uh, an, another team that's not ranked, uh, I know that they're close to the top 25, uh, but the St. Louis Billikens, they're a team that is uh, really, really talented. Uh, coming into the season, they were either the, you know, the first or second favorite uh, to win in the A-10, but they're quite the opposite of the Belmont Bruins. The Billikens have had not one but two stoppages due to COVID. So uh, right now they are on Joe Lenardi's first four out. I believe they're currently the four seed in the A-10 tournament. Their first game is tomorrow. So they're going to have some work to do. They need a really, really strong showing. Uh, probably getting to the championship game, if not outright winning it, is what's necessary for them to make it into the tournament. So we'll have to wait and see if they even make it. Uh, but the St. Louis Billikens are certainly a team uh, to keep an eye out on as well that's not ranked. Drew, I know you yeah. watch a lot of college basketball, or at least do some college work through your work. IMG radio producer. Is there a college team that you've been hearing or, you know, you like? That, that, you know, you've had a chance to, to watch through any of your work? Any surprise? Well, you brought up, uh, who'd you bring up? You brought up Belmont. Uh, you know, obviously they're going to have to win their conference tournament to get in. I think that's a one big bid league. And another team that uh, probably needs to win their conference tournament is Winthrop. They're 
21 and 1 on the season, 17 and 1 in conference play. Common likes that they played so many games, uh, but their one loss was in conference play by two. So uh, watch out for the Eagles if they make the tournament. Yeah, that's that's the caveat with Belmont and Winthrop. But I mean, mm-hmm. I like seeing that good record. There's something about like a winning culture. It doesn't always work out, but I like seeing it. I mean, certainly Belmont will probably lose in the first round and sucker me and Tom in. But I think Winthrop might have won a tournament game a few years ago. Does that sound that sounds familiar? They're usually about a 13 seed, 14. Uh, you're, you're right. They probably did. I I can't remember for the life of me which game, but they they probably did. I'm also hoping for UMBC to get in the tournament when the Amer- the American East is that what they're in or American Conference? I can't even America East. America East, yeah. They had that first 16-1 upset a couple years ago. My dog is a golden retriever. I don't know if you heard him uh, barking in the background earlier. He gets easily excited. Um, So I would love for the retrievers to do well, the UMBC retrievers. Uh, Probably get a 16 seed again, uh, maybe a 15 seed. I would thoroughly enjoy the retrievers picking up a first-round win, as long as it's not over Gonzaga, because that's who I'm picking to go all the way. (laughs) <laughs> so we'll, we'll we'll see it and next week we'll compare our regular season college uh picks see how we did in the regular season um and we'll do we'll do our uh power five picks who's going to win uh those conference tournaments um and in a couple of weeks we'll talk march madness men's side we also might make a pick on the women's side as well uh that that could be fun uh, UConn looking back to uh, being number one again. Uh, they've got that fantastic player number five. I can't remember her name right now, but I always see her on Sports Center getting buckets. So, um, but yeah, uh, looking forward to the college tournament. We did have some news today in the NFL. Uh, ben Roethlisberger uh, is back for the Steelers one more year. Contract Castleman uh, the de- now. The Steelers did not disclose the terms, but a source told ESPN's Adam Schefter, which we know this is right, that Roethlisberger willingly reduced his pay to $14 million uh, from $19 million in his final year of his contract and spread the cash payment through 2022. The move lowers the team's salary cap by more than $15 million. Guys, uh, what do we think about uh, this move for Big Ben and the Steelers? Good move. Certainly a quarterback at the twilight of his career, but I think this is a great move. I'll give my specifics on it in a bit, but what do you guys think about Big Ben coming back to Pittsburgh for one more year? Well, I mean, it's it's the best overall compromise. Uh, I believe prior to this reworking of his deal, he was due to have a $41 million cap hit. Um, And in a year where the cap, I think, Prior to COVID, the cap was uh, probably up around like 220, something like that, or 210, 220. Um, now it's around 180, I think, maybe 185. Uh, so the cap actually came down for the first time in a long time simply because there wasn't a lot of revenue coming in. So I think this was the best compromise where I don't think the Steelers wanted to outright cut Ben Roethlisberger. He's not ready to retire just yet. Um, so I think this is kind of like the best of both worlds for both of them. Uh, they get to you know, keep a, you know, all-time franchise quarterback on their roster. And, uh, you know, he gets to play in one place for his career. I don't know if this will necessarily be the end, but uh, he's in his late 30s, and we've seen a pretty sharp decline in his uh, his ability to really push the ball downfield. So I think this will be kind of more of a last hurrah scenario, and then, um, you know, he'll ride off into the proverbial sunset. Well, if you, if you're the Steelers, it's like, well, what do we do after? And you know, you think of the Aaron Rodgers, Brett Favre situation where he sat behind him for however many years and it worked out really well. Well, you know, Mason Rudolph, is he the quarterback of the future for the Steelers? I'm not sure, but you know, they they either have to draft a quarterback or have somebody behind him who's going to learn this season because uh, you know, Ben may not physically still have the arm that he did, but, man, his uh, quarterback IQ is very, very high. Yeah, I think we're all kind of on the same page. I think 
Uh, Roethlisberger isn't necessarily the long-term answer, but in the short term, absolutely. For next season, he's hands down uh, the best option. He'd be better than any rookie you, can, you, rookie you can bring in and really better than any quarterback in the free agent market. I mean, unless you can somehow get, you know, the uh, Wilson or um, Watson trades, but, I mean, that's probably not going to happen. I think uh, Ben Roethlisberger's arm strength has gone down. Um, a little bit, but he had a pretty good year last season. I mean, they started 11 and 0. He finished 12 and 3 as a starter. Uh, didn't play the last game of the season. Uh, he wasn't really the problem with their offense. It was the fact that they had the worst uh, running game in the league. Uh, he had a pretty solid season: 33 touchdowns and 10 interceptions. He was just under 4,000 yards. He would have gotten a 4,000 uh, had he played the last week of the season. Um, his passer rating, 94 this last season. 94 is his career passer rating. Uh, certainly that speaks to uh, the IQ he has, as Drew said. Also speaks to uh, it being even more of a passing league now than earlier in his career. But, I mean, he was a better than average quarterback in the NFL uh, this last season. So I think uh, the Steelers simply are not going to get someone better. The fact that uh, he is going to take essentially $5 million less than a year. I think it's a great deal for both sides. I think Roethlisberger has a little something left to prove. I think uh, he had all those turnovers. I know he put up a lot of yards, but I don't think he wanted his last game uh, to be a game where he had like five turnovers against the Browns and mm-hmm. loses in the first round of the playoffs. It almost makes me think of Tom Brady when he had that interception uh, with the Patriots, his last throw, uh, and people thought, well, He's going to come back, and I think certainly I think Brady has more left in the tank than Roethlisberger, but uh, I think he's definitely a competitor. Uh, he's had injuries that have slowed him down, but I think for one more year, I think it's a fantastic deal. It's a good deal for both sides. I think he plays one more year, then I think he retires. Yeah, I really do, and I think we've seen that Drew Brees probably going to retire. It's crazy. We just had Philip Rivers retire a few years ago. Eli Manning retired. Um, you know, even few years back of that Peyton Manning. So we're seeing all these quarterbacks that we kind of grew up watching as kids kind of ending their, their career. Uh, so it's, it's been, it's been a true pleasure to watch all of them play. Yeah. And uh, kind of shifting over to, you know, another NFL legend who is not going to have the same luxury that Ben Roethlisberger has is now on a different franchise entirely uh, J.J. Watt signed a deal with the Arizona Cardinals, two years, $31 million. I think the particulars have it closer to 28, and he's got about uh, $3 million in, like, very difficult to get incentives, something like getting back-to-back uh, 10 sack seasons, which he hasn't done in years and years. Um, but uh, what do you guys think about that move for the Arizona Cardinals? Does it move the needle for you at all, or do you think the team is kind of largely staying in place? I think it moves the needle a little bit just because you look at the Cardinals. They were essentially one game away from making the playoffs. Had they won one more game, they would have made the playoffs. I mean, J.J. Watt is past his prime, but I think he can help you win a ball game, with, given with how close some of these NFL games are. And it's a great fit. Uh, if you look at the statistics since 2012, uh, Chandler Jones on the Cardinals is uh, first in the NFL in sacks. J.J. Watt is second. So certainly the last two years, J.J. Watt hasn't been as efficient as, you know, as he was earlier. But three years ago, he was still incredible. So I think he's faced a lot of double teams. He's faced a lot of injuries. Certainly I think he is on the down end of his career. But playing with a guy like Chandler Jones, I think that's going to help both of them because uh, they're not going to face as many double teams as they used to, particular Watt. Uh, I think uh, Jones is kind of the top dog there, and I think it's going to help a Watt get maybe a couple sacks more than he would have in Houston. And I think uh, I think certainly injuries uh, have hurt him. I think a change of scenery, a chance to kind of be more of like the number two pass rusher type situation, uh, that's going to help him. I think it's a great deal for, for both sides. And it just, j- yet again, it adds another Houston Texan that they got, they had, Um, Hopkins they got last year. Now they get J.J. Watt. And Watt is also a culture guy. Uh, Arizona has Larry Fitzgerald, who's, uh, you know, a pro, a true culture guy. J.J. Watt is another leader. Uh, He's really 
one of the players that's most respected in the NFL. He continually does more for good causes and good charity than almost any other athlete, and he's truly a good man. So he's a guy that's going to help, you know, a young quarterback like Kyler Murray, a young head coach, kind of kind of a team that has a young vibe. I know they have a few experienced players, but you can never get more leaders. There's never enough. So I think it's a great move for, for both sides, much like the Roethlisberger thing. These two guys may not necessarily be the stars they were four or five years ago, but they're still good players, and I think it's a great move. I mean, in the I mean, last, in the 10, last years, 10 years, J.J. J. J. Watt, Echo, J.J. <laughs> uh, J. Watt, you know, he uh, is second in the league in sacks uh, in the last 10 years, first in force, first force fumbles, first in fumble recoveries, first in batted passes. So, J.J. Uh, J. Watt, I mean, you know, it is after his prime, but he's legit. And so, yeah, the question is, who are teams going to double team in Arizona now? Like you just you can't do you can't double team Chandler Jones. You have to pick. Is it going to be Jones or Watt? So I, I think the Cardinals are excited, and I think the Cardinals fans should be excited as well. Yeah, the Cardinals yeah. almost became my adopted team last year. Tom Castleman, me and Tom both adopted wrong teams. I mean, of course, I'm always uh, Chiefs Chiefs Nation over here, and the Bears, of course, but. That's kind of, you know, I don't have much expectations for the Bears. I'll go with the hometown team and then the heavy favorite in the Super Bowl. That sounds right. And then, of course, Tom Brady does me in, uh, does me in good. But. As, as he is wont to do. Uh, yeah, no, I think the, um, you know, the addition of J.J. Watt to the Arizona Cardinals, I think it's fairly significant. But, I mean, we're at the very beginning of the offseason. There are still a lot of different moving parts. And the Cardinals are going to need to move some parts uh, to really improve, Common, I mean, you mentioned that they finished, uh, you know, just just outside the playoff picture. But something we have to keep in mind, and that as a Bears fan, I am very well aware of. Yes, the Bears made the playoffs, but it was as the added seventh seed. Otherwise, is the Bears would have finished two games out of the last playoff spot, uh, which uh, the uh, the Rams held. So I think that. Um, you know, this move, it does improve the Cardinals, but I think they're still the third or fourth best team in the division. I mean, you look at San Francisco, they were just hammered with injuries. I don't think they could be any more injured this upcoming season than they were last season. And they're certainly on par, if not a little bit better uh, than Arizona with talent. And of course, you know, we know what the Rams are doing, adding all the talent that they have and just no first round picks whatsoever, but they have the best defensive tackle, best uh, cornerback on defense and then they're making their offense better with Matthew Stafford. And then presuming that the Seattle Seahawks hang on to Russell Wilson and, and don't try to trade him to some other team because they have some sort of falling out. It's difficult to see the Cardinals really moving up in weight class, so to speak. So I think it's a solid first move. It only costs them money to make the move. Um, But I think they still have a long ways to go before they're going to be a team that is, you know, sitting atop the division. They're going to definitely have to take a bit of a, an underdog route to get there this year. You don't think they'll be a wild card? You're not feeling them getting in as a wild card or something? I can't really. Like, it's it's the best division in football, so I think that they will have multiple wild card teams. But, I mean, just so much depends on, on you know, health. If, if San Francisco improves their quarterback position, moving on from Jim Garoppolo, you know, I, I put the Rams and the Seahawks currently above the Cardinals, and then you've got San Francisco battling it out. So it's going to be tough. They can do it, but there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, beating each other up in that division. Yeah, I think I think that is definitely the best division in football. Uh, San Francisco, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Jimmy G. Uh, I, think, I think actually if he's healthy, I think he's a pretty good quarterback. Mm-hmm. So that that is an issue in itself. I mean, he's got an insane winning percentage as a quarterback in the National Football League. Uh, I think the Rams uh, got better. I'm hoping the Seahawks trade Russell Wilson to the Bears. That would be exciting. I think we need a quarterback. He did list the Bears as one of the teams uh, he would like to get traded to. If I'm Seattle, I draft an offensive lineman. The first pick of the draft, I draft an offensive lineman. The second pick of the draft, and I consider even drafting an offensive lineman the third pick in the draft because uh, Seattle has a pretty bad offensive line. Wilson has mm-hmm. been getting stacked like crazy. They've got two fantastic receivers. 
uh, on the outside in Lockett and Metcalf. So I think um, they definitely need offensive line help. So they're really going to have to prove to Wilson and tell him, like, look, man, we're going to get you an offensive line because I think that would be a terrible move for Seattle to let Russell Wilson go. And I think it's not as much of a Deshaun Watson situation. I think Watson definitely wants to move on. I think Wilson sees the receivers he has on that in that team. So if, if the organization can kind of put it together, they should be able to hold on to their star prize. Here's hoping for the sake of, uh, of all Seattle Seahawks fans. Uh, so now moving on to uh, what is the most contentious portion of the show uh, by far. We have locks of the week. Um, I was kind of loosely keeping track, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, as a program, we went two for two out of nine. We, we, we did pretty poorly, I think, this, uh, this past week. Okay, Tom, you're always hating on our picks, but... Two weeks ago, we were all like, or three weeks ago, we're all two and one. We've had some good weeks. This was definitely not not the week. This was I a downer. Is we had Drew Brackett go zero and three, and he missed a Premier League under. That never happens. He always bets Premier League under, and it always gets under, and it went way over. He bet two and a half. We had four goals in the Arsenal Leicester City game. I think it was karma for him pronouncing it. Leicester City instead of Leicester City. It must have been must have been the karma of the mispronunciation in that game. And then he also missed NHL. We had over six goals. It was three goals. And Lakers Jazz 114-89 final, well under 219.5 points. Drew's had a lot of good weeks recently. Last week was not one of them. Tom Castleman horribly missed R.J. Barrett's total on points, assists, rebounds. He had, like, mm-hmm. one bucket the whole game. Uh, got the, so bad. Yeah. He got the Jokic over on, on points, assist, rebounds. And then Jamal Murray missed it by half a point. That Barbecued was me. But I will I, not be deterred. Yeah, I will not be deterred. I missed um, the Homer pick. I had my Homer show the week last week. Mizzou, of course, choked against Ole Miss. Uh, they never win when I pick them. So I probably should stop doing it. Uh, I did have a great win in Texas, minus two and a half over Kansas. Texas wins by three points. They hit a late free throw because of the fouling situation. Just a magical win. Uh, Barcelona, Alche over three and a half goals. It was 3-0. Uh, there was some controversy there where I probably should have gotten a fourth goal. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of opportunities that did not score the goal, but nonetheless uh, were – We're moving on. This is going to be a good week for me, a good week for the show. Drew Brackett, by the way, with that 0-3 week, is now only one game ahead of me for first place in the standings. Uh, Tom Castleman still way in the back in third place. Guys, what do we have this week? All right. So had a little bit of a rough time with some of the props last week, so I'm going to go back to that, of course, because why would I learn a lesson uh, at all? So we've got a late game tonight, the Golden State Warriors and the Phoenix Suns. Uh, Steph Curry and Draymond Green are both out for tonight. So that means that we're going to see a lot more shots from a lot less efficient shooters. That means rebounds. Golden State isn't very good at rebounding the ball as a team in general, uh, giving up about 15.7 rebounds per game to the center position. So I'm going to go ahead and take DeAndre Ayton. Over 11.5 rebounds at minus 114. Uh, Shea Gildress Alexander in the Thunder Spurs game. He scored 40 against San Antonio earlier this season. The Spurs give up on average about 27.9 points per game, uh, which is uh, worst in the league. I believe he is at 23.5 is his over-under. So go over on Shea Gildress Alexander points. And then uh, Pistons Knicks. Uh, that game already started, so I'm not going to pull a Kenchev. I'm not going to pick that one. Uh, this is a little bit of a coin flip for me. I've got uh, two two solid feelings on the Portland Trail Blazers and Sacramento Kings. Uh, I'm kind of on the fence. Let me see if I can get the most up to date number here. If I want, we've got to get minus, the best number here. 
Do I want minus four and a half for the Trailblazers, or do I want to take the over? Uh, both are really good. I think. Uh, let's see. I'll go with the. Uh, I'll go with the spread. I'll take Trailblazers minus four and a half against the Sacramento Kings. Yeah, since you said it, you stole my pick there, but I'm not. I'm not changing course. I'm going Blazers minus four and a half over the Kings as well. So. That, you know, take it with a grain of salt. We both picked it. I don't know if that's bad luck or good luck. We'll find out. So long out. as you don't put a mortgage on it, I think we're okay. We're, I'm not advising any mortgage-level bets this week. I did hear a game where someone made a reference to, like, betting your mortgage on something, and I just about died. So no mortgage bets this week. I, I do like the Blazers minus four and a half uh, over the Kings. Both teams coming off back-to-back -back games. Uh, but the Blazers are at home back-to-back -back night. So the Kings are having to travel uh, to Portland for this game. The Kings, by the way, are just 2-8 and eight in their last 10 games. 2-8. and eight. And one of those wins was last night where they barely beat the Lakers, who were without LeBron, who were without Anthony Davis, they were without Mark Gasol. So I, I like the Blazers covering 4.5 over the Kings. Uh, you talk about another game. You, you mentioned uh, Steph Curry and Draymond Green both being out. Well, those are the Warriors' two best players, the Warriors' two best passers. I don't even know what they're going to do at the point guard position in this game. The Suns coming off a big win uh, over the Lakers. Uh, Suns minus 11 and a half. I feel good on that one. That should be a route. The Warriors actually have gotten blown out quite a few games this season. So this should be another one of those. And my final one, I'm going to say for Sunday soccer, and I'm going to pull a droop racket over here. I'm going to go English Premier League under Manchester City and Manchester United under three goals. When these two teams meet, it tends to go under. Last four meetings, 2-0 uh, win for Man City, 0-0 zero, zero draw, 2-0 Man U, 1-0 uh, Man U. So we haven't had three goals between these two teams in the last four meetings. So I feel pretty good. I think we might see more of a 2-0 win for Man City, who can't seem to lose a game. Those guys are just on an insane winning streak over there under Pep Guardiola, the former Barcelona coach, the legend, one of my favorite coaches in the world. Uh, but I think his team actually only wins by like two goals and wins 2-0 or something under three goals. You mean two and a half goals. Is it two and a half now? Did it move? It moved. Oh, oh so I'm getting worse odds because I had it mm -hmm. under three goals earlier. Uh, oh, I thought goals. you said two and a half to begin. Okay, well, it'll be under two and a half goals, under three goals, whatever. There isn't going to be more than two goals scored in that game for sure. Well, is it two and a half or three? I have it at three, man. This is what I have written down. Man U, Man City under three goals on Bovada as of about three in the afternoon today. So it may have moved. You may check that. But I would, I'll take it at under three. Hmm. All right. Well, I'll, I'll take that at under three as well then. I, I originally had it at under two and a half, but I'll take a half goal. Absolutely. It's at three on Bovada. Oh, all right. Well, then I don't know where I was looking, but. Uh, EPL Sunday, I'll start with the uh, final pick of mine, Man City, Man U. All the reasons Common stated. I'm hesitant, though, because if Common's in it, must mean something <laughs> is wrong with it. But I'm going to go ahead and take the under three goals in that contest. Uh, but back to the soccer, or continuing with the soccer well, those are two teams that I actually know. Uh, two teams, two other teams I know, uh, Bundesliga. Saturday morning, Bayern Munich and oh. Dortmund take I, under three and a half goals in that contest. Two I very good teams. Wait for that game. I'm fired up. Actually, a lot of good soccer this weekend. We got we got that game at 11:30 Saturday. Then uh, Sunday we have 9:15 Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid in La Liga. Then 10:30 we have uh, Man uh, Manchester City, Man United. Of course, my Barcelona game is at two o'clock on Saturday. So lack of NBA, but uh, minus the All-Star game Sunday night stuff, but a lot of good soccer to watch uh, Saturday and Sunday morning and early afternoon. Yes, and continuing with my locks of the week, uh, 
in a game that Common will for sure be watching because, again, it's, it's great soccer Saturday and Sunday. We're going to go back to uh, England, Norwich City, Luton Town, and the Championship League, I think it's called. Go under two and a half those goals in that game. Common will be streaming it. Great soccer this weekend. Uh, hopefully not a lot of goals. So, by the way, Tom, if you don't know what mm-hmm. he was referencing, he's referencing the second division of England. Uh, so they're basically in, in soccer – you get relegated. The top three, the bottom three teams get relegated each year, and three mm-hmm. teams from the second league get pulled up to the main league. So Norwich City actually, by the way, typically is in the first league, but they're currently now in the championship league, which is ironic that they call the championship league the one where teams right. get relegated. But if you watch that show, Ted Lasso, and you'll, you'll see them talk about that. I love that show. Uh, it won the award, a Golden Globe nominee for Best mm-hmm. Comedy Series. Uh, it's about an American coach that goes over to coach, a college football coach, goes over to coach soccer in England that doesn't, doesn't know anything about the sport. He's basically Tom Castleman, and he goes over there and, and coaches soccer. Just a phenomenal feel-good story. All these crazy times we have, if you want a good-hearted laugh, that show, I strongly recommend it. That Bayern game, under three and a half. I don't know what I said, but three and a half. Under. Oh, really? Okay. That, yeah. that, by the way, Bayern Munich is a goal-scoring machine, and Dortmund is pretty good. I think I probably disagree with your pick there, just, just, just so you know. <laughs> no surprise. No surprise. Um, you have done pretty bad with your Bundesligas over unders, by the way. You've done insanely good with your Premier League, but your Bundesliga have actually been pretty poor. So there's a good chance you might miss that just because their Bundesliga picks have been very bad this year. Well, we'll, we'll see how the uh, championship league treats me. And, you know, if we have to go third division, we will have, we, you know, it's possible. Yeah. If there is one. There is definitely a third division, yes. Oh, man. <laughs> Do they also have the relegation of the bottom three and top three? Uh, I think so. Gosh, I'd have to look it up because different countries do it differently, but I think so. I think that's like a, a European soccer system based wide thing. And then if I miss on that, we'll just go to the Bulgarian soccer league. Bulgarian soccer league is not doing so well. Uh, <laughs> they have, you know, the Europa League. Um, Wudu Goritz made the Europa League, and they got. Is that a person or a team? <laughs> it's a team. Yeah, they got hammered in the Europa League group stage. It was not pretty. Is that a is that the best Bulgarian team out there? They are well at the moment, not historically. Historically, it's either Tesica or Levski. But all right, so those are the yeah, got it. I yeah. couldn't name the blue those, blood of the EPL. Probably Liverpool. I don't know. Oh, Liverpool is having a bad year. They're like oh, favorite. I know, but. Are they a blue blood? Are they historically yeah, yeah. one of the best yeah, teams? Yeah, blue blood. absolutely. They're the Lakers and Celtics of the Bulgarian Soccer League. Who? Sasaka and Levski. Ah, oh, got League. it. Got it. Yeah, you may look. You may look into those those bets. So we we will see. Well, sticking sticking with soccer, for my statement of the week, I'm going to go Homer. I'm going to say I'm proud of my Barcelona soccer team. There has not been many moments to be proud of the last few years. What used to be the best team in the world from 2009 to 2015-2016 range, the last few years they've been a shadow of themselves. And they've had some games where they've blown late leads. They've seemed to lose, you know, a team that used to win all the big games. They've lost a lot of the big games. Well, I had a phenomenal Wednesday afternoon yesterday watching Barcelona soccer. We were down 2-0 after the first leg against Sevilla in the Spanish Copa del Rey semifinals. So we had to win by three goals this game or tie it, tie it, win by two goals and send it to extra time. 93rd minute, last minute of stoppage time, 93rd, 94th minute, Gerard Piquet gets a header goal, tying the game at two, sending it to extra time, where the boys pull out the win in extra time and win 3-2, to two, advancing to the Spanish Cup Final. I was absolutely ecstatic. 
losing my mind, yelling at the TV during the goal. The only sad thing was that Ray Hudson was not on the call because he only calls La Liga games. He doesn't call the Spanish Cup games. Uh, my statement is that I'm going to pour in a little wishful thinking here. So I'm going to say that Barcelona soccer is going to get back to being one of the very top teams in the world uh, which they weren't last year, and they didn't look like they would be this year. I think that Lionel Messi, the greatest soccer player of all time, maybe the greatest athlete of all time, uh, namesake for my dog, I think that he's going to stay at Barcelona soccer. A lot of rumors floating around that when his contract runs out this year, uh, he's going to be gone. I think he likes what the young kids are doing, what was impressive about this latest comeback. He didn't even score a goal. That almost never happens where they win a big game without a messy goal. So I think Barcelona soccer is going to come back. They're going to win the Spanish Cup, and they're going to make an insane comeback in the Spanish League. Atletico Madrid is going to choke away the title. Barcelona wins La Liga. They win the Spanish Cup. Messi comes back next year, and all is back in somewhat happy in Barcelona and in my soccer world. I don't know if I have anything to add to that. Wow. <laughs> All right. Wow. What a, what a Homer pick. <laughs> Love the Homer I was going to say that. Speaking of adopted teams and all that. Oh, boy. Uh-oh. Uh, so for my salute of the week, uh, I am going to um, do a salute, then a, a statement. So brief salute to the Major League of Baseball. They don't get a lot of things right as of late, uh, but they certainly did with uh, this most recent, uh, uh, I guess, event that they're doing. They're making June 2nd Lou Gehrig Day, uh, honoring a baseball legend who battled a mitrophic lateral sclerosis, better known uh, or more commonly known as ALS. Uh, There is currently no cure for the disease. Uh, As you might remember, uh, a couple years back, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, Um, MLB is going to have this as an I'm sorry? I did it. Did you? you oh, you did it? Oh, I did not do it. I did it. And I hate the cold water, but I did it. Yeah, this, well, it was. I was nominated on social media by someone I worked with at the TV station I worked at. So that just would have looked really bad if I didn't do it. Fair enough. Yeah. But it, it did a great, it was a big internet sensation. And now MLB is going to have a day every single year. Uh, there's going to be uh, charitable donations for uh, research as well as awareness for ALS. So good on MLB uh, for both honoring a, a time-old uh, uh, baseball legend and doing something progressive for uh, some disease research. My statement of the week, also going with a homer pick here, the Chicago Bears will, all capital letters, W-I-L-L, have a superstar quarterback on their roster by the beginning of next season. NFL Network's Michael Silver is reporting that the Seahawks are not happy with Russell Wilson, presumably with how he's publicly aired his grievances about the team, and are currently listening to offers from his four preferred uh, destinations, the Las Vegas Raiders, Dallas Cowboys, New Orleans Saints, and Chicago Bears. Additionally, L.A. Rams cornerback uh, Jalen Ramsey spoke about the biggest standoff in recent NFL history on the Huddle and Flow podcast, saying that he highly doubted that uh, Texans quarterback Deshaun Watson will suit up for that team ever again. What makes Ramsey privy to such information? He shares the same agent with the 25-year-old superstar quarterback. Yes, the Bears are a desperate team, arguably the most desperate team for a quarterback, and maybe, just maybe, fate is going to smile on the cold, wintry city of Chicago and offer them an opportunity to fix a franchise old problem. Bears, make it happen. So real quick, by the way, I'm all 100% for this, 150% all for it. I've been really big on the Wilson to the Bears thing recently. Uh, Two quick questions for you, Tom. One, Mm -hmm. who would you rather have, Russell Wilson or Deshaun Watson? Watson. That's not even close. Not close because he's younger? He's, he's younger, and I think he's better. You think he's better? Yes. Oof, that's tough. I'm not sure who's better. Uh, like for, think, me, for me, it goes Mahomes, Rodgers, Watson. 
And then Wilson is probably like fourth or fifth. I'd have to like think about it a little bit more. But like he's up there for sure. But I would much much rather have Deshaun. Don't Lamar. forget Lamar Jackson. <laughs> don't don't forget Josh Allen. Yeah, I'd probably have Allen and then Wilson's five. Yeah. Yeah, good. You forgot Lamar Jackson. I love it. Um, yeah, uh, and then the other question is, mm-hmm. um, it sounds like you think, well, two questions, X. Wilson is more likely to happen, and also, do you think Watson would have any grudge towards the Bears not drafting him the first time around? It depends on if the Texans receive any other offers from, you know, the New York Jets or the Miami Dolphins, you know, teams that actually have better assets to offer in terms of higher draft picks and younger quarterbacks. If it comes down to it's Chicago or bust, he'll go Chicago. Uh, I do think Wilson is the more likely uh, guy to end up in Chicago out of the two of them. And uh, again, they're both under contract, so there's nothing saying that they have to get traded. Uh, but teams more and more starting to acquiesce to, to players' demands, especially when it comes down to, you know, you can find me, but I'm not going to show up for training camp, you know, and, and good luck running a team, you know, without the most important decision maker on the field. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to say my misstatement is it's bold because it is so unlikely to happen, but I'm going to say that the Bears will have one. It's not both. They're not going to have both. They're going to have They're one. They're not going to have both. Yeah, what was, I found really interesting about Wilson's list is, like, the Cowboys. I know Dak Prescott coming off an injury. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Saints, I think Drew Brees is retiring, but we haven't heard Probably. about that yet. The Raiders, uh, they also have Carr. I mean, I think Watson is an upgrade, but I think Carr is pretty good. Mm-hmm. So, like, almost when I look at that list, to me, it's like, I guess maybe the Saints, if Brees is gone. But even the Saints, you know, with that Winston and um, – Oh, uh, gosh, Taysom Hill. I had a really dumb mm-hmm. moment there for a second, that combo there. Um, I think the Bears are definitely the team that would be willing to give up the most with Seattle. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know what you think about this, though. I think that Wilson would be in a better situation to stay in Seattle than go to Chicago, personally. But, I mean, I hope I hope he, he would choose Chicago, but I would choose Seattle if I were him. I mean, I think part of it is that he, he's having some issues with Pete Carroll. It's there. There's like some like unsourced reporting going on where people are leaking stuff, but not putting names on it um, that he, he he's kind of done with the whole Pete Carroll thing. And the reason you know, I, I asked, you know, why would Wilson want to come to Chicago? Uh, there's there's like a little bit of a pity factor in there. It's just like if I come in and do anything at all, I will be a legend in that city uh, so he's kind of like looking from a legacy perspective of like, oh, I can like fix the Bears quarterback position. And I mean, like, yeah, we'd all fall for it. Like, <laughs> Come yeah, on down. I, I don't know. I think I think if they got Russell Wilson mm-hmm. and maybe one or two more receivers, linemen, I don't know, all of a sudden things could Looks be a lot better. Bears QB position. I would love to see it. Me too. Drew, what you got for us? Yeah, uh, well, the NBA All-Star Weekend is Sunday, and out of all the uh, All-Star events, out of all the leagues, uh, obviously I think we all agree the Pro Bowl is probably the worst. Uh, The NBA is up there for one of the best, and just adding on this Elam ending, you know, a target score, you uh, have an untimed fourth quarter, you have a target score, I think that's awesome, and you know, that's when the guys really start to play defense, and that's where it is a very competitive game, and we'll see that again Sunday. You know, the first three quarters really doesn't matter that much, but fourth quarter, these guys will show up, they'll sweat, and it'll be exciting, so looking forward to that. But I've always been a sucker for the NBA All-Star game, and as I mentioned, it's probably one of the best out there. I think the best baseball's right up there. NHL is good. Football very far back. Real quick, because I forgot to mention this earlier, and I meant to do it. So the right now, about seven o'clock, they're about to have the NBA draft. Uh, LeBron and Durant are the captains. They're picking players. Mm. You have the first pick in the NBA All Star game, LeBron or Durant. Who would you take with your first pick in this All Star game? I would go with uh, the Embiid P of the league. 
Joel Embiid. He's big, he's talented, he's fun, so I would go for the 76er as my first pick. I would go with Giannis Antetokounmpo. My pick is between Curry. <laughs> he was texting. He didn't even hear any of our picks. What? <laughs> you didn't have an argument for either of our picks. I could have said Russell Westbrook, and you had been just moved on. No, no, no. I heard you. And oh. the argument for me is between uh, Giannis and Steph Curry because I think in an all-star game, even though they have improved the defense a little bit, I think you still see a lot of open looks. You see a lot of dunks. I look at who are the best players in transition and who are the best three-point shooters. Well, along with LeBron James, who obviously we can't pick in this game because he's the captain, uh, the best transition player and scorer in the league is Giannis. He is maybe even better than LeBron between them two. Uh, So I would take Giannis would be great in transition, but then you have Curry who could hit a lot of open threes. It all depends on uh, how hot Curry is but I'm feeling a big weekend for Stephen Curry. I'm feeling he wins the three-point contest. I'm feeling he wins the All-Star Game MVP. He lets it rain from deep. I'm going Curry to disagree with Drew. No Giannis Antetokounmpo for me. Give me Steph Curry if I'm drafting. Who are the coaches? Oh, gosh. I think It's uh, Quinn Snyder and Doc Rivers. Yeah. Okay. So I was going to say, if, like, Steve Kerr was coaching – and he was coaching Curry, Curry wouldn't play that much. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. Well, Embiid, maybe Embiid won't play that much. So, Tom, maybe you went wrong. Drew may have a point on you there. Nah, he's still my first pick. All right. You're picking a Kansas guy, the Mizzou graduate, picking a University of Kansas guy. And also, is it Cameroonian? Oh, I where he's from. I so. Yeah, I think he's – yeah, yeah, I think that's correct. Yep, Cameroonian. He's a, and isn't he, it? He's a fun personality. Mm-hmm. Yes, he is. Can you name my favorite University of Kansas basketball player of all time? Well, well, I have two that I'm thinking of, but I, uh, we'll go with who? Who am I thinking of? The two. The Morris twins, of course. No. Steve Mihailuk. No. Tom, Tom, you ought to get this one. Uh, uh, Mario Chalmers that's a good one think further back Danny Manning not that that's far. also a good one uh. my number two is really far back my number one is like when we were kids when we were kids so I that was Kansas basketball when we were kids I didn't start watching college hoops until like 8th grade he was probably on Kansas about eighth grade. Nah, he might have been in the league by then, but close to that. He's he was on almost on Kansas basketball around then. I think I think he he was in the league. Heinrich, Kirk Heinrich, yeah. Ooh, Captain cool. Kirk, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Very hey, good, good call. I, I should have thought of that one. Yeah, and my number two is. I mean, most, probably Wilt. Wilt but... Chamberlain. The most yeah. wonderful player in basketball history. Probably a solid number two or three all-time, probably number three all-time greatest player, but you rarely hear him mentioned in the top five. So, I mean, 50 and 25 rebounds in the season, 22 rebounds and 30 points over his career. I mean, like, I get it. Like, back then, you put up numbers, but no one was scoring as many points as he was. You look at the career all-time points per game leaders – like, no one from – I mean, they scored more points total, but he was way more dominant. Like, Bill Russell, like, 15 points a game. Will Chamberlain, 30 points a game. Easy mm-hmm. answer. And people held Bill Russell with all the rings or put Bill Russell ahead of Will Chamberlain. That really gets my axe grinding. Really. I mean, really I, I don't know. In, in playing 2K, man, we play the all-time players, and, yeah, Will gets every rebound and is very, very good. So, yeah, give, give me Will. Do you remember when we played NBA 2K Drew, like in college, and you would? No, pick, I don't remember that. You would pick the Lakers, and you would let it rain from three with Byron Scott and completely obliterate me. Really? No. Byron Scott, yeah, he was. Well, we played like twice. It was it wasn't like a regular thing. Where but was I, that at? Whose place? 
it was it was at your place and oh, we, were, really? we were playing like I was like the ninety six Bulls, of course, and you were like the ninety one Lakers or something, and you that's like Magic Johnson and you would just kick it out to Byron Scott and Byron Scott would start raining threes on me and and I'm really at that game since I haven't really played it much, I'm a more of a PlayStation guy and we were playing on Xbox. I'm like terrible at shooting. Like I'm not like Oh, you know, Xbox 2K. Got it. Got it. Now I ha- okay. Okay. I thought we were playing like, you know, when you lived with JC and we we're playing one of your PlayStation games. No, no, this was at your place. We're playing <laughs> All right. Now now I re- yeah, it was in my room. Now I remember. I got it now. Yeah, and we I think we had like $5 little Caesar's pizza. Like true college, college. Oh, and I'm sure we ate the whole pizza after, and well before, during, and after. Of course we did. That pizza was gone, and so was so was the scoreboard. I would just I tried to ball hog the game with the ball with Michael Jordan every time. I'm like Michael Jordan. That's what I used to do on NBA 2K3. I would play a <laughs> classic, and I would score 100 points with Michael Jordan against the computer just because it's Michael Jordan and I wanted to score. So I thought I would use that same strategy against you, and I had limited success, but not enough, because you were making threes with Byron Scott. My dunks were worth two points. Your threes were worth three. You were playing analytics on me before the analytics got big. Uh, You know, I, I, I was, and I guess that's how I play 2K. It's funny you say that, because when I play with my roommates, I just shoot threes. So I guess it's the analytics again. Uh, I guess that's how I've played for 10 years. And I guess you, ever... you probably win. You flick the joystick really well, you know, just at the right moment to release it. Well, that's why I shoot threes, because I know exactly when to release it. It's quite frustrating for my opponents. Yeah, Have you ever gone over 27? No. <laughs> Did you hear him? No, I didn't hear him. What? No, I said, have you ever gone over 27? I have not. Uh, I think my worst was I went like 0 for 15 one game. Oh, that was a problem. But see, if I don't make them, I just stop shooting them. Mm-hmm. But the other Unlike night I made rockets. the other night I made 20 against my room roommate, and that's probably my all time high. Who are, I was like 20 for 40 something. Who are you playing as? Oh, it was an all-time team. I think it was, uh, yeah, it was the all-time Sacramento Kings. So you yeah. had Peja, you had Mitch Richmond. Mm-hmm. Um, he had 10, I think. What? Mike Bibby? Yeah, uh, yeah, he did, he wasn't it. I think it was a combination of just Richmond and Stoyakovich. I think Chris Weber had one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was just pulling up from the logo at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Logo Drew. Yes, it's quite uh, fun. Yeah, so, Tom, you know Drew and I get competitive, and I remember just going over there and playing 2K and just being very frustrated. I mean, Byron Scott was a good three-point shooter, but he made Byron Scott look like Stephen Curry. I mean, you knew that that house, we were very good at video games. You knew what you were coming into. This is true. They're also I mean, very, very we had house. three consoles. Yeah, but if we played FIFA on PlayStation 2, I would beat you. Well, sure, sure. But you remember I went to Walmart at midnight and got the games. I mean, you were you were probably there, actually. Yeah. Yeah, Drew's a big big gamer. I need to pull out my old PlayStation 2. I'm not as much of a gamer. I was a gamer in middle school. We played, like, FIFA and Madden a lot, me and a few friends. And it got pretty intense. And actually, we would do the career mode where we draft, like, the players, and we play on teams. And I remember mm-hmm. one game I played my friend, and, like, we would play with our teams, and we would play the opposing team. And I won on, like, an 80-yard Hail Mary. And my quarterback was, like, Chad Pennington. And he didn't even throw it very far because he couldn't. And the guy, like, was, like, Lavernius Coles broke, like, seven tackles and got the touchdown. It was something. Wow, was- Lavernius Coles. That's a name. That is a name. <laughs> that is a name. So, Goodness. Anyways, I think that does it for week 21. Drew Brackett is probably going to go play 2K now since I got him in the mood for some NBA video game hoops. I'm probably going to watch the actual NBA games. K 
keep an eye on our locks of the week tonight. I think uh, Suns Warriors, or is it, I think it's Suns Warriors is the TNT, or it might be Blazers Kings. One of them mm. is certainly the TNT Thursday night game of the week. And Tom Castleman and I will be cheering on the Blazers, his adopted team for the season, mm-hmm. my adopted team for the night. Have a good, <laughs> good week, everyone. <laughs>